quantum mechanics from a 1D model all the way to a 3D model. What happens is we're unfortunately forced to convert to spherical coordinates, which makes the Laplacian a lot more complicated. But if we make the assumption that u is only dependent on r, the equation is actually solvable. So you get two equations, this one and that one. And you can keep working with the trick that if one side is a, a function of one variable and another side is a function of different variables, then both of them must be equal to a constant. You can use that fact to work through it and slowly reduce these to bare bones single variable differential equations. Finally, we be doing the anticipated transformation of quantum mechanics from 1D to 3D. Oh, oh wow, it's actually harder to draw than I expected. Uh, I forget how a 3D3 looks on a win. All right, so now, you, as you will probably predict, that gets pretty hard. Now, why is this? I mean, you're only adding two more dimensions to an already complicated two-dimensional system. So how bad can things get? Well, let's start by looking at the Schrodinger equation by itself. Minus i h bar partial t psi. This is in 1D, by the way, but the time term doesn't change anyhow. h bar squared over 2 h bar squared over 2 pi partial x squared psi minus some potential energy function psi. So what's going on here? Well, actually, we already know what's going on here. We've been covering it for a lot of lectures. How does this transform to 3D? Well, the first thing you'll probably notice is that we can no longer use this. This is instead the Laplacian. But here's the problem. The potential is a very nasty function. Let me give you an example. If I have the gravitational force g m m over r squared, the potential is inevitably going to be minus g m m over r. But do we even see any components of theta or psi here? If we switch the spherical coordinates, which we need for the radius, do we see any of the other two components here? And furthermore, what happened if we translate this to Cartesian? Ugh. And this is even worse. Well, yeah, you get a square root. Therefore, I mean, a lot of potentials depend solely on radius. But if we choose to go in Cartesian coordinates, all of our potentials, or at least most of our potentials, are going to depend on three variables at once. And why is that a bad thing? Well, here's what we want to do, essentially. In the past, we've been dealing with a tidier equation. This is only u of x. And in one dimension, x and r are practically the same thing, except r is the absolute value of x. But now in three dimensions, these two are totally different. They can't even be compared at all anymore. So, what do we do? Well, let's try keeping things in Cartesian first. How bad can it be? This extends to partial x squared psi plus partial y squared psi plus partial z squared psi minus u psi. Now, let's see what happens when we do the standard thing we try whenever there's a Schrodinger equation in front of us and split this into an equation of x, an equation of y, an equation of z and an equation of time. Most things aren't factor factorizable like this, obviously. Very few are. So, what happens when we do this? Well, we get 
this side is going to become. Plus partial one, partial, so, sorry, psi one, psi two double prime, psi three, psi four. Psi one, psi two, psi three, double prime, psi four, all encircled in there, minus u psi, oh boy, is equal to minus i h bar, psi 1, psi 2, psi 3, psi 4. So as a standard protocol, we divide both sides by psi in order to make sure that one side is a function of some variable and the other side is a function of variables not including the first, which means that both sides have to be equal to a constant, which makes things a lot easier. So what happens if we try to do that here? Well, we get... Minus i h bar psi 4 prime over psi 4. So far, so good. h bar squared over 2 pi psi 1 prime prime over psi 1 plus psi 2 prime prime over psi 2 plus psi 3 prime prime over psi 3 plus, well, no, there's no plus, minus u. And now, things are looking good so far, because this side is a function of t, and this side is a function of x, right? But now, what happens when we actually try to solve this side? Well, once again, we assume that, well, we've already done as much as possible with our assumption. And now, ideally, we would be able to split this into two sections. Ideally, we would be able to take these terms and keep them on one side, and these terms and keep them on the other side, so we have two more things that both have to give constant. But this is not dependent on just x. It's also dependent on y and z, which means it's totally impossible to isolate anything like that, and this becomes unsolvable. So, unfortunately, we're going to have to default to the spherical Laplacian and spherical coordinates. Unfortunately, the spherical Laplacian looks much worse. It's a black. You get spherical Laplacian is 1 over r squared, partial r, r squared, partial r, plus 1 over r squared sine theta, partial theta. I think it's sine theta partial theta, plus 1 over r squared sine squared theta, um, it's definitely partial psi, I think it's partial psi, oh no, it's partial psi squared, that should be right. Okay, so this is the spherical Laplacian, and this looks much worse, but at the end of the day, it's still the Laplacian, and so we can still solve equations using it, as opposed to alternative of trying to solve this, which is you know, impossible. So what happens when we plug things in that way? Well, now dividing them by psi has some more horrific consequences. We now get, well, this side is still pretty easy to work with. Nothing, out, nothing actually changes. Here, oh no, you're going to get 1 over r squared. This is going to be 2r, um, this is going to be 2r squared partial r, oh, oh, so it's going to be 2r psi 1, so we're going to break this into psi 1 of r, psi 2 of theta, psi 3, psi of phi, psi 4 of time, this is going to be 2r psi 1, prime plus r squared psi 1 double prime uh, divided by psi 1 plus this is going to give us cosine theta 
uh, partial theta, so it's going to be psi 2 prime plus sine theta, psi 2 double prime over psi 2, plus 1 over r squared sine squared theta, psi 3 double prime over psi 3, is equal to a constant. Oh, sorry, I forgot the potential term. Now, this looks horrific at first, and it looks like all hope is lost. But, fear not, because we can now work around this to get something more beautiful. We take this term, h bar squared over 2 pi r squared, to pi uh, 2 over psi 1 prime over r, no, let's do 2 pi r, 2 psi 1 prime plus r psi 1 double prime divided by psi 1 minus u over r is equal to, well, whatever is a function of everything else on the side. But you might notice one inaccuracy. Everything here is actually a function of r as well, which is this. Well, fear not, because now we can just multiply by r squared on both sides. And we get h bar squared over 2 pi, 2r psi 1 prime plus r squared psi 1 double prime over psi 1 plus, but now this eliminates the r squared factor, so we're going to write minus u of r is equal to some constant minus 1 over, sorry, constant r squared, which means you actually have to move it here as well, 1 over sine theta, cosine theta, psi 2 prime, plus sine theta, psi 2 double prime, over psi 2, plus 1 over sine squared theta, psi 3 double prime over psi 3. And as bleak as things seem, this is now equal to another constant, which is the same as this, because this is a function of r, this is a function of uh, phi and theta. So now, I mean, what do we do? Well, things become a lot easier from here for this side, because we can multiply both sides by psi 1, and we get c1 psi 1 is equal to h bar squared over 2 pi to r psi 1 prime plus r squared psi 1 double prime minus u r minus c r squared. Now solving this is not, oh sorry, psi 1 minus c r squared psi 1. Now solving this is not impossible, but it's an ordeal we'll have to undertake later. And as for solving the other side, well, we'll get to that soon.